गुड मॉर्निंग एवरी वन नमस्ते आई होप आई एम श्योर इट्स अ वेरी वेरी गुड मॉर्निंग टूडे बिकॉज आई एम गोइंग टू टॉक समथिंग अबाउट अफकोर्स भरतनाट्यम अफकोर्स अबाउट कोरियोग्राफी बट इन अ डिफरेंट वे भरतनाट्यम दो रीजनल डांस फॉर्म फ्रॉम द साउथ इन पर्टिकुलर लिंक्ड टू तमिलनाडु हैज ओवर द ईयर्स बिकम वेरी पॉपुलर नॉट ओनली थ्रू आउट इंडिया but all over the world almost in every part of the country one will find a bharatanatyam dance class and little children even older people meticulously and laboriously learning the style and whenever i have traveled to different parts of the world i have always found some form of bharatanatyam class sometimes formal sometimes not so formal teaching setups what i mean to say is that today the teaching and learning of bharatanatyam have truly become democratic and have no restrictions whatsoever hence it is all the more important that we structure at least the basic of the style and also the tools required to move forward with the techniques learned initially institutionalized teaching has brought some structures to the system but unfortunately the learning and teaching of this form is still largely done in the guru shishya parampara where there is one teacher imparting all the skills as she or he has learned it from his or her guru or teacher also today it is not just students who know the south indian languages who are learning the dance form in fact there are many foreigners who are wanting to not only learn the form but also want to be able to teach the form so we need to put down structures that facilitate correct learning in fact today the south indian languages that is tamil and telugu in which this dance form is traditionally based are alien to most of the students learning the dance form it is often an uphill task to make them understand the nuances of these languages so special care and interest has to be invested in imparting the meaning and ideas underlying the lyrics the students learn gurus need to first familiarize students with our ancient epics legends and mythology which form the foundation of the indian classical dance experience i think knowing the mythology is very very important suppose a padam is being taught of course the word meaning line meaning raga the composer and all other relevant details are taught but it is also important to teach the context the characters reference situation state cultural milieu and so on many a time a certain simple mannerism could convey the regional cultural context much better than many elaborate hasta interpretations also multiple possibilities to a single line of poetry or phrase need to be explored even as one is teaching or learning a piece also very important is the music the correct pronunciation of lyrics the correct breaking up of words while singing so that the sense of poetry is not lost but is greatly enhanced all these details are very important when a piece is attempted today since the dance has traveled to almost all the states of india one enjoys the freedom of including in bharatanatyam the poetry in various indian languages the dancer does find it much easier to emote in her own language and suddenly the dance becomes his or her own the content used is largely poetry written in the bhakti kal and hence different poets though separated by geography have almost expressed more or less similar sentiments the regional flavor of course is always interesting 
and helps the dancer adapt the composition with the Bharatanatyam tools that they have imbibed. But there are a few aspects that one has to follow while choosing poetry in known South Indian languages. Singability, the music should be tuned in such a fashion that it does not sound strange and out of place in the Bharatanatyam music cadence context. What one means is that sometimes the very strong Carnatic music ragas, for example, a Kamboji or a Karahara Priya might not be the best choice to set a couplet from say Kabir Das. Some common ragas to the Hindustani music tradition and the Karnataka music tradition could work better. However, this is not a formula since no one methodology works always. Each piece requires fresh thinking on the part of the dancer and the musician to create synergy between the poetry, the music, the content and the cultural context of the piece through the lens of Bharatanatyam. One good example has been Bharat Ratna, the late Srimati M. S. Subalakshmi's work that she did many years back where she sang the poetry of Mirabai in Karnataka music but so very intelligently crafted the rendition in crossover ragas like Maan, Desh, Sindhu Bhairavi and Yaman. Many times in my observation, experiments with poetry in different languages have worked when the dancer and the musician have a clear understanding of the aesthetics of sound and movement with a strong grounding in Bharatanatyam. Many young dancers ask me as to when and at what point should one or can one start innovating and experimenting. The answer is very clear in my mind. I feel before one steps out of the fold as it were, one must have a thorough understanding of all aspects of the tradition itself, its margam, repertory and exploration and potential of what is possible within the format. Many times I have seen dancers experiment for the sake of experimenting without really having fully explored the possibilities within the tradition. It is not enough to just learn many pieces from the repertory. It is also important to perform and practice them over and over many times in order to explore it to the fullest and internalize it. Only then when you finally decide to push the frontiers are you better equipped to do so. Of course, nobody can say to any artist that Yes, now you are ready to innovate. It is a natural and slow process. What is key is that the experimentation should grow organically from one's work and convictions. Another problem faced by students of dance today is whether they should learn from different gurus or for how long. In the current mal culture that is even seeping into our classical arts, dancers often shop for items from various artists so that they get more performable pieces. This seems to be a rather disturbing trend because this is bringing in a lot of confusion in the students in terms of style, thought process, attitude, philosophy and so on. When you learn from one senior reputed knowledgeable guru, you don't just learn the technique of dance or the item, but you learn a certain approach, a thought process, an ideology towards the art form. When you change too many teachers for whatever reason, I find it leaves one confused and the art falters. Acquiring knowledge is always great but you also need to synthesize what you learn. Introspection and digesting what you learn is also a process a guru teaches which requires patience and time. Learning a skill or a vocabulary and then thinking about it 
introspecting, internalizing are all equally important. Revisiting pieces and finding new meaning and interpretations is probably the most exciting part of teaching and learning of classical dance forms. Many times one is asked as to what are those boundaries within which one can create. It is very difficult to draw or set boundaries when it comes to creating work in a genre particularly classical Bharatanatyam. The do's and the don'ts have to stem from one's own understanding and sensibility of the form and is a very personal decision. This capacity or calling it discerning power comes from sound basic training also watching and learning as others create. Giving importance to the process and carefully watching your own teacher create is very important. I have seen in a class when I am creating say a piece there will be some students who will be very involved in every step. They travel with me every stage of the creative process and there will be some others who will just wait till the phrase has been set and are interested only in the finished product and want to quickly be able to dance that phrase and collect the new material. This then is the essential difference in the attitude of someone who can later create and someone who however as a good performer need not necessarily be able to create work. The excitement of the classical world is that there are enough spaces for both journeys. Also one must realize that just like in a formal education system there can be many approaches to teaching a traditional classical dance. If you have had a very conservative kind of education, you certainly think and act quite differently from someone else who might have had a more liberal kind of education. The same holds for dance education as well. However, the attempt should be to soak oneself in all the aspects of art, be it visual, poetry, music, theatre or any other form of expression. The aim must be to widen one's canvas of creativity. For example, in my career as a performing artist at various times, to expand the frontiers of my classical dance performances, I have collaborated with a wide range of dancers, musicians, craftspersons, authors, writers, poets, painters, theatre personalities, academicians, philosophers, linguists and costume and fashion designers. The performance scenario as we see today is very different from what it was when I started learning dance. In the late 1960s when my parents would take me to see concerts as a little child, I remember watching Indrani Rehman performing different pieces in different styles namely Bharatanatyam, Kuchipudi, Odissi in the same one evening. People would obviously dedicate the whole evening towards watching, enjoying, experiencing dance. In the 80s of course the compartmentalization of styles was more rigid and we saw performers performing in specific styles. Such recitals would last for say two and a half hour. I would like to narrate an interesting anecdote which I heard from the legendary performer Yamini Krishnamurti. I was once interviewing her and I asked her about jatis or tirmanams as they are called in some schools. Earlier as we all know jatis used to be short and crisp. Today we see long winding jatis which never seem to end and often do not even make any sense in terms of the grammar and format of the principles of rhythm. I asked Yamini Akka about her journey and she had a very interesting and candid point. 
She said when she first arrived in Delhi and started performing, nobody knew anything about Bharatanatyam. Kathak held sway and was the style that was most well received and many great Kathak gurus lived and performed in this city. In those days, performances used to start at around 8 p.m. and continue through the night. Yamini Akka's turn would come sometime past midnight after a very well established Kathak guru and very often people would leave because they were not familiar with this dance form from South India. She thus started performing her own pieces in a much faster pace and often did a particular jati twice over to attract people and create an oral and visual impact. What I mean to say is that many changes that we see today are often due to responses to circumstances and situations and were not deliberately planned or thought out as performance strategies. Today we see a lot of changes in the presentation of Bharatanatyam in terms of formats and pieces. Often students and performers don't get a whole evening where they can reposefully delineate their entire margam format. Programs are short, often sandwiched between other events. This demands of the dancer the ability to deliver very energy-packed, impactful renditions, often fast-paced and concept-based. This kind of formatting requires a completely different orientation and training. The traditional training is geared towards a more slow rendition of various facets of Bharatanatyam one by one so that a true rasika can enjoy and savor them. Unfortunately, this is not the case now. People want instant gratification. Hence, in crafting short performances, dancers pick up those aspects of Bharatanatyam that communicate instantly, elements that are most arresting and dazzling. The more intense, subtle, graceful, philosophical, thought-provoking aspects get left out because they require a certain relaxed setting and an environment that enables the evoking of a certain sentiment or a rasa. Today, in most performances, the effort seems to just prove a stamina point and not necessarily to create a memory pool which one would like to visit again and again. But all is not lost. In this changed scenario, I must also mention the good possibilities which have opened up. Newer formats are being thought out. Various musical techniques are being employed to convey abstract sentiments and situations. The linear narrative has been replaced with abstract ideas and thought-provoking choreographies. Characters from mythology are being revisited, recast and re-evaluated. Social concerns are being addressed though the powerful medium of classical dance. Much more research in terms of content is being observed and classical dance is attempting to match the tenure and to convey the message clearly and aesthetically. This is a challenge in contemporary creativity. Similarly, music for dance has also evolved in terms of its range and possibilities. Experimenting with various forms of music is quite acceptable today. Freedom to break away from the traditional formats coupled with newer content has brought about changes in the process of creating work and hence demands understanding of many other parameters which were may not so important earlier. Today, dancers and musicians are together exploring multiple possibilities before zeroing in on the final approach and methodology. 
and judicious use of various elements comes with much practice and experience. Also the possibility of collaborations has opened up and there are many artists who have watched and admired each other's work over a period of time decide to collaborate. This requires pushing frontiers for both artists and discovering common ground and evolving together. Personally, when I have collaborated with other artists from other genre, I have got to learn a lot about other disciplines and have adopted some of their core principles into our dance philosophy. For example, when I collaborated with a puppeteer friend many years back, it was very interesting to watch them so beautifully improvise in various situations, namely different performance spaces, dealing with wear and tear of puppets, last minute crisis management and so on. Their cohesiveness as a team was amazing. No one thought solo. The interdependence, for example, is worth mentioning. While operating a large puppet, one artist would operate the feet, the other the spine and the third the arms. It required so much of understanding and coordination. We as a group of dancers often lack cohesion. This largely stems from the fact that the entire training process in the classical is geared towards creating solo performers. Therefore, when we start thinking about group work, we really need to come up with a lot of activities and unlearning processes that can bring about a change in the orientation of the dancers wherein they get used to also imagining multiple bodies at any given point of time. The most encouraging aspect today is that apart from the special academic institutions dedicated to the performing arts, some universities like Jawaharlal Nehru University, Shiv Nadar University and Ambedkar University for example have started specialized facilities for interdisciplinary study of performing arts. This in need is a positive signal for furthering our commitment to the performing arts in our country. I am sure you will agree to this. Thank you.